Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 16. When a 29-year-old woman changed her clothes three times before attending an 11-year-old boy's birthday party, she was in trouble. So Bill lectured herself on the simple fact, even as she stripped off a white silk blouse, white silk for Lord's sake, what had she been thinking of? and exchanged it for a teal turtleneck. She was going to a simple, informal family dinner party, she reminded herself, not a diplomatic reception, which she admitted with a sigh would have posed nearly as much of a social or fashionable dilemma. She knew exactly what to wear, how to behave, and what was expected of her at a formal reception. State dinner, a gala, a charity ball. It was a pathetic statement on her narrow social experience. She concluded that she knew neither how to dress nor how to behave at her own nephew's birthday party. She slipped a long chain of silver beads over her head, took it off, cursed herself, and put it on again underdressed overdressed what did it matter she wouldn't fit in anyway she would pretend she did the quins would pretend she did and everyone would be desperately relieved when she said her goodbyes and went away two hours she told herself she would only stay two hours surely she could survive that everyone would be polite would avoid awkward or nasty scenes for seth's sake she picked her upper brush to smooth her hair back then secured it with a clip at the nap of her neck before critically studying herself in the mirror she looked confident she decided pleasant non-threatening except maybe the color of the sweater was too vivid too bold gray might be better or brown good god the ringing of the phone was such a welcoming diversion she all but leapt on it yes hello dr griffin seb you're still there i was afraid you'd taken off Gloria! Her stomach plummeted to her unsteady knees. Very carefully, she lowered herself to the side of the bed. Where are you? Oh, I'm around. Hey, I'm sorry I ditched you the other night. I was messed up. Messed up, Sibyl thought. It was a good term for certain conditions. From the rapid pace of Gloria's speech, she assumed her sister was messed up even now. You stole money out of my wallet. I said I was messed up, didn't I? I panicked, you know, needed some cash. I'll pay you back. You talk to those Quinn bastards? I had a meeting with the Quinn family, as I promised I would. Sibylla curled the hand she punched in her fist and spoke evenly. I'd given them my word, Gloria, that both of us would meet them to discuss Seth. Well, I didn't give mine, did I? What they say? What are they going to do? They say you were working as a prostitute, that you abused Seth physically, that you allowed your clients to make sexual advances toward him. Lies. Fucking lies. They just want to kick me around. That's all they... They said, Sibyl went on coolly now, that you accused Professor Quinn of molesting you nearly a dozen years ago, intimidating that Seth was his son, that you blackmailed him, that you sold Seth to him, that he gave you more than $150,000. Oh, bullshit. Not all, but part. Your part could be acutely described as bullshit. Professor Quinn didn't touch you, Gloria. Not 12 years ago, not 12 months ago. How do you know? How the hell do you know what? Mother told me that Raymond Quinn was your father. There was a silence for a moment, and only Gloria's quick breathing. And he owed me, didn't he? He owed me. Big deal college professor with his boring little life. He owed me plenty. It was his fault. It was all his fault. All those years. He didn't give me dick. He took in scum from the street, but he didn't give me dick. He didn't know you existed. I told him, didn't I? I told him what he'd done, and who I was, and what he was going to do about it. And what does he do? He just stares at me. He wants to talk to my mother. He's not going to give me a fucking dollar until he talks to my mother. So you went to the dean and claimed he molested you. Put the fear of God into him. Tight ass son of a bitch. She'd been right, Sibyl thought. Her instincts, when she walked into that room at the police station, had been right after all. It was a mistake. This woman was a stranger. And when that didn't work, you used Seth. Kid's got his eyes. Anybody can see that. There was a suckling noise, a hiss, as Gloria dragged on a cigarette. Changed his tune once he got a look at the kid. Kids, he gave you money for Seth. It wasn't enough. He owed me. Listen, Sibyl. Her voice shifted, whined, and trembled. You don't know what it's like. I've been raising that kid on my own since he was a baby, and that prick Jerry DeLotner took off. Nobody was going to help me. Our dream, our dear mother wouldn't even accept a phone call from me, and that prissy freak she married and tried to pass off as my father wouldn't either. Couldn't dump the kid, you know. Couldn't. I could have dumped the kid, you know. I could have dumped him any time. The money social services doled out for a kid is pitiful. Sabir stared out through her terrace doors. Does it always come back to money? 
It's easy to look down when you've got plenty of it, Glory Snap. You never had to hustle. You never had to worry. Perfect daughter always had plenty of everything. Now it's my turn. I would have helped you, Gloria. I tried two years ago when you brought Seth to New York. Yeah, yeah, same old. Get a job, straighten up, get clean, get dry. Shit, I don't want to dance to that, kid. It's, this is my life I'm living here, baby sister, not yours. You couldn't pay me to leave yours. And that's my kid, not yours. What's today, Gloria? What? What the hell are you talking about? Today is September 28th. Does that mean anything to you? What? The hell is it supposed to mean? It's fucking Friday. Your son's 11th birthday, said Bill thought and straightened her shoulders and took her stand. You won't get Seth back, Gloria. Though we're both aware that you're, that's not your goal. You can't. Shut up. Let's stop playing games. I know you. I haven't wanted to. Prefer to pretend otherwise, but I know you. If you want help, I'm still willing to get you into a clinic to pay the bill for rehab. I don't need your goddamn help. Fine. That's your choice. You won't get another penny out of the Quins. You won't come near Seth again. I'm giving my deposition to their lawyer and a notarized statement to Seth's caseworker. I've told him everything, and if necessary, I'll testify in court that Seth's wishes and his best interests are served by his remaining permanently with the Quins. I'll do everything I can to see that you don't use him anymore. You bitch. The hiss was filled with anger, but under a shock. Think you can screw me this way? You think you can toss me off and slide me those side with those bastards against me? I'll ruin you. You can certainly try, but you won't succeed. You made your deal. Now it's done. You're just like her, aren't you? Glory spit the words out, but but out like bullets. You're just like our ice kind of a mother, perfect society princess, and underneath, you're nothing but a bitch. Maybe I am, said Bill thought wearily. Maybe I'm going to have to be. You blackmailed Raymond Quinn, who done nothing to harm you. It worked, at least it worked, well enough for you to get paid. It won't work with his son's glory, and it won't work with me. Not anymore, won't it? Well, I'll try this. I want a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand or I'm going to the press. Natural quiet, hard copy. Let's see how fast your lousy book sells once I tell my story. Sales will likely increase 20%, Seville said mildly. I won't be blackmailed, Gloria. You don't, you do what you like. And think about this. You're facing criminal charges in Maryland, and there's a restraining order against you to keep you away from Seth. The Quins have evidence. I've seen it. She continued, thinking of the letters Gloria had written. Further criminal charges for extortion and child abuse may be brought. I've cut my losses if I were you. She hung up on the spew of her sinities and closed her eyes, lowered her head between her knees. The nausea was a greasy sea in her stomach. The sneaking edge of a migraine was creeping closer. She couldn't stop the trembling. She held it off during the phone call, but she couldn't stop it now. She stayed just as she was until she could control her breathing again until the worst thick of threat of sickness rescinded. Then she rose, took one of her pills to ward off the migraine, and added blusher to her pale cheeks. She gathered her purse, Seth's gifts, a jacket against the chill, and left. The day had been endless. How was a guy supposed to sit through hours and hours of school on his birthday? I mean, he was double ones now in everything. He was going to get pizza and french fries and chocolate cake and ice cream, probably even presents. He never actually had a birthday present before, Seth Muse. Not that he could remember, anyway. He'll probably end up with clothes and shit, but it would still be a present if, any, if, everybody, if anybody ever showed up. What's taking them so long? Seth demanded again, determined to be patient, and to continue to slice potatoes for the homemade fries that Seth had requested as part of his birthday menu. It'll be a long. <laughs> it's almost six. How come I, how come I had to come home after school instead of going to the boatyard? Because <laughs> Seth had left it at that. Stop poking into everything, will you? She added as Seth opened the refrigerator again. Shut it again. You're going to be stuffing your face soon enough. I'm starving. I'm making the fries right now, aren't I? I thought Grace, were gonna, I thought Grace was going to make them. Steely eyed and a stare at him over his shoulder. Are you suggesting that I can't make french fries? He was bored and restless enough to be pleased that he jabbed her ego. Well, she makes real good one. Oh, she turned completely around. And I don't. You do okay. Anyway, we'll have the pizza. He nearly pulled it off, but snorted out a chuckle. Brat Anna made a laughing dive at him. He danced away, howling. That's the door. That's the door. I'll get it. He raced off, leaving Anna grinning after him. But the wicked laughter faded from his eyes when he opened the door and saw Seville on the board. Oh, hi. Her heart sank, but she fixed on a polite smile. Happy birthday. Yeah, thanks. Watching her cautiously, he opened the door. I appreciate you inviting me. At a loss, she held out both shopping bags. And 
Are you allowed to have your gifts? Sure, I guess. Then his eyes went, All that? She merely sighed. It sounded so much like Philip had. It all sort of goes together. Cool. Hey, it's Grace. Hampered by the bags, which he held now, he bumped past her onto the porch. The joy in his voice, the quick delighted smile on his face, was such a marked contrast from the way he looked at her. So Bill's sinking heart cracked. Hey, Grace. Hey, Aubrey. I'll tell Eddie you guys are here. He darted inside again, leaving Sabil standing by the open door without a clue how to proceed. Grace got out of the car and smiled. Sounds like he's excited. Yes, well. She watched Grace as Grace set a bag on the hood of the car, followed by a large, clear plastic cake, cake holder, and then she reached into an unstrapped to unstrap a babbling Aubrey from her car seat. Do you need a hand? Actually, I could use two. Just a minute, baby. If you keep wiggling, she tossed another smile over her shoulder so Bill walked up. She's been wired all day. Seth is Aubrey's favorite person. Seth! He's got a birthday! We baked cake! <laughs> We sure did. Grace hauled Aubrey out and passed her to an astonished Sibyl. Do you mind? She wanted to wear that dress, but the run from here to the house is bound to be a disaster. Oh, well, Sibyl found herself staring down into a beaming angelic face and holding a bouncy little body dressed in a partially pink ruffles. Party pink ruffles. We having a birthday! Pate! Aubrey told her and put both hands on Sabil's cheeks to ensure her full attention. I'll have a party next time when I'm free! You can come! Thank you. You smell pretty. I do too. You certainly do. Sabil's initial stiffness couldn't stand up under that cheerful, charming smile. Philip's Jeep pulled in behind Grace's, and most of the stiffness returned as Cam slid out of the passenger seat and shook. Shot her a cool, unmistakably warning look. Aubrey let out a shriek of green. Hey, hey! Hi there, beautiful. Cam walked over and kissed Aubrey lightly on her comically pursed lips, then aimed those swifty eyes at Sabil. Hello, Dr. Griffin. Sabil. Well, able to intercept the chilly exchange, Philip strode over, laid a supported hand on her shoulder, and leaned in for the kiss Aubrey was on. Hi there, sweetie. I have a new dress, and you look stunning in it. In the way of females, Aubrey deserted Sibyl without a glance and held out her arms to Philip. He managed to transfer easily, setting her on his hip. Been here long, he asked Bill. No, I just got here. She watched Cam carry three large cardboard boxes of pizza in and out. Philip, I don't want to cause any. Let's go inside. Took her hand, pulling on. We've got to get this party going, don't we, Ab? Circuit's presents. They're secret. She whispered, leaning close. What a day. Uh-uh, I'm not telling you. He set her down when they stepped into the house, gave her a friendly bottom of friendly pat, and sent her off. She shouted for Seth and scrambled to the kitchen. She'll blab. Determined to make it work, so Bill put her smile back in place. I won't. Nope. You can just wait for it. I'm going to grab a fast shower before Cam beats me to it and uses all the hot water. He gave her a quick apple. And I'll get you a drink. He added as he headed upstairs. Great. On a half of breath, so Bill steeled herself to deal with the Quins alone. The kitchen was pandemonium. Aubrey was squealing. Seth was talking a mile a minute. Potatoes were frying. While Grace been in the stove since Cam and Anna trapped against the refrigerator with a glimpse of pure lust in his eyes. You know how I get when I see you in an apron. I know how you get when you see me breathe. <laughs> and she hoped it would never change. Nonetheless, she never arrived. Hands off, Quinn. I'm busy. You've been slaving over a hot stove. You really ought to take a shower. What would mean? I'm not going to. She spouted. She spotted the movement out of the corner of her eye. There you are, Sibyl. In a move that looked very practiced and very effective to Br to Sibyl, Anna shifted and jammed her elbow in her husband's stomach. What can I get you to drink? Uh, the coffee smells wonderful. Thank you. I'll take a beer. Cam snagged it out for it and go clean up. He aimed that look at Sibyl again and strode out. Says, stay out of those bags. Anna ordered as she pulled a mug. No gifts yet. She made that decision to keep him from opening Sibyl's gifts until after dinner. She calculated that his aunt would make her excuses and run as quickly as she could manage it after the little ritual was complete. Man, is it my birthday or what? Yes, if you lift her up, why don't you take Aubrey into the other room? Entertain her for a while. We'll eat as soon as Ethan gets here. Well, where is he anyway? Grumbling said, stalked out with Aubrey on his heels and didn't catch the quick grin. Grace and Anna exchanged. That goes for you too, dogs. Anna gave Foles a nudge with her foot and pointed her finger. With canine size, both dogs clipped out of the kitchen. Peace! Anna closed her eyes over. Momentary peace! 
Is there anything I can do to help? With a shake of her head, Anna pressed over, passed over the mug of coffee. I think we've got it under control. Ethan should be here any minute. And the big surprise? She walked to the window to look out through the gathering dark. I hope you brought an adolescent appetite, she added. Tonight's menu consists of pepperoni and sausage pizza, pizza, peanut oil fries, homemade hot fudge sundaes, and Grace's killer chocolate cake. We'll all be in the hospital, so Bill commented before she nodded through, even as she winced, Anna was laughing. We... We who are about to die salute you. Uh-oh, there's Ethan. She lowered her voice to stage whoops. We're at the stove. Grace dropped her slotted spoon with a clatter. Did you burn yourself? No, no. Chuckle we can grace away. No, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna run out and help Ethan. All right, but, hmm. Anna finished when Grace hurried past her and out the door. Jumpy, she muttered and hid the outside lights. It's not quite dark yet, but it will be by the time we finish this. She savaged the last of the prizes, which also Cam and Philip better put a fire in it. Oh God, it's cute. Can you see? Too curious to resist, Sib joined her at the kitchen window. She saw Grace standing on the dock, catching caught in the last light of the day, and Ethan just stepping onto it. It's a boat, she murmured. A little sailboat. A tin footer. They called it Pram. And a smile nearly split her face. The three of them have been building it over at Ethan's old house, the one he rents out. Lieutenants let them use the shed over there to Seth, so Seth wouldn't know about it. They built it for him. What? Whenever they could steal an hour. Oh, he's gonna love it. Well, what's this? What? That! Anna said and stared hard through the glass. She could see Grace talking, her hands locked together. Ethan staring at her, and he lowered his head to hers. I hope there's not any. She trailed off as Ethan drew Grace clothes, buried his face in her hair, and rocked, and her arms came up around him. Oh! Oh! Tears flowed in her son. She must be. She's pregnant. She just told him. I know it. Oh, look! She grips the bill's shoulders. Shoulder when Ethan scooped the laugh and Grace up into his arm. Isn't that beautiful? The two of them were wrapped around each other, making one silhouette in the last light of day. Yes, yes it is. Look at me. Laughing at herself, Anna yanked off a paper towel and blew her eyes. I'm a mess. This is going to get to me. I know it is. I'm going to want what? She blew a good sign. I was so sure I could wait a year or two. I'm never going to be able to wait that long now. Not for that. I could just see Cam when I... She stopped herself. Sorry, she said with a watery laugh. It's all right. It's lovely that you're so happy for them, that you're so happy for yourself. This is really a family occasion, especially now, Anna. I really should go. Don't be a coward, Anna said, pointing her finger. You're here, and you're going to have to face this nightmare of indigestion and noise just like the rest of us. I simply think all she could do was close her mouth. When the door burst open, Ethan was still carrying Grace, and the pair of them wore a huge mouth. Anna... We're having a baby. <laughs> Ethan made the announcement with a catch in his voice. What am I? Blind? She brushed Ethan aside to kiss Grace at first. I'm at my nose to the window. Oh, congratulations. They threw her, then threw her arms around both of them. I'm so happy. <laughs> you have to be godmother. Ethan turned his face to kiss her. We wouldn't have got this far without you. Oh, that does it. Anna burst into tears just as Philip walked in. What's going on? Why is Anna's crying? Jesus, Ethan. What happened to Grace? I'm fine. I'm wonderful. I'm pregnant. No kidding? He plucked her out of Ethan's arm and kissed her lavishly. What the hell is going on in here? Cam demanded. Still holding Grace. Philip grinned at him. <laughs> We're having a baby. Oh, yeah? He arched an eyeball. How does Ethan feel about the two of you? Ha <laughs> ha! What's Phil's coming? She said Grace carefully on her feet. You feel all right, Cam asked. I feel terrific. You look terrific. Cam drew her into his arms, rubbed his chin over her head, and the tenderness with which he did both that's a bill blinking in surprise. How's it going, bro? Cam murmured Ethan. Thanks. Can I have my wife back now? <laughs> I'm nearly done. Cam held Grace's arms. If he doesn't take care of you and that little Quinn in there, I'll beat the hell out of him for you. Are we ever going to eat, said the man and stopped at the kitchen doorway and said, why is Anna and Grace crying? He slept an accusing look around the room, including Sabil and the Ian. What happened? We're happy. Grace sniffed and accepted the tissue that Sabil dug out of her. I'm going to have a baby. Really? Wow. That's cool. Wow. That's way cool. Does Ob know? 
No, Ethan and I would tell her in a little while. But now, I'm going to go get her because there's something he needed to see outside. Outside? He started for the door, but Philip stepped nearly in his path. Neatly in his path. Not yet. What's... What is it? What is it? Come on, man. Move. Jeez. Let me see what's out there. We should blindfold him. Philip should consider. We should gag him. Was Cam's suggestion. Ethan took care of matters, but I won't set the over his shoulder. When Grace brought Aubrey and Eastman Wink shipped the wiggling set and headed out the door. You're not throwing me in again. Seth's voice rang with terrified delight and giggles. Come on, guys. The water's really cold. Wimp. Cam sneered when Seth lifted his face from Ethan's back. If you try, Seth warned. I stand with joy and challenge. I'm taking at least one of you with me. Yeah, yeah, big talk. Philip pushed Seth's face down again. Ready? He asked when everyone was assembled at the edge of the water. Good. No it Ethan. Man, the water's cold. Seth began, ready to scream when Ethan dropped him, but he was set on his feet, and he was turned to face the pretty little wooden boat with sky blue sails that ripped lightly in the evening wind. What? Where did that come from? The sweat of our brows, Philip said dryly, while Seth gaped at the moon. Is it? Who's buying it? There's an offer for sale. Cam <laughs> said simply. It. Is it? It, c it couldn't be, he thought. With his heart thumping with nerves and hope and shock. But hope was paramount. The past year he learned to. Is it mine? You're the only one with a birthday around here. Cam reminded him. Don't you want a closer look? It's mine? He whispered it at first. With such staggered delight and shock, spilled out her eyes. Thing. Mine? He exploded with it as he rolled around. This time, with your jaw on his face, closer enough. To keep? You're a good sailor, Ethan told him. She's a tight little boat. She's steady, but she moves. You build her for me? His gay shot from Ethan's face to Phillips the camp. For me? No, we built her for some other brat. Can't give him a light sweat on the side of the head. What do you think? Go take a look. Yeah, his voice quavered. Quavered a little as he turned. Yeah, I can get in her. Can I sit in her? For Christ's sake, she's yours, isn't she? His voice rough with emotion. Cam grabs that hand and all him onto the deck. I think this is a guy thing, Anna murmured. Let's give them a few minutes to pull themselves together. They love him so much. So Bill watched another moment as the four males made noses over a little one, but little wooden boat. I don't think I realized it, really, until just now. He loves them, too. Grace pressed her cheek to Aubrey's. And it was more, Sibyl thought later, as she peeked at the meal in the noisy kitchen. It had been that shock on Seth's face, the utter disbelief that someone loved him, could love him enough to understand his heart's desire. And understanding made that effort to give in. The pattern of his life, she thought wearily, had been broken, shifted, then reformed, and all before she really come into it. Now it was set the way it was meant to be set. She didn't belong here. She couldn't stay here. She couldn't bear it. I really should go, she said with a well managed smile. I want to thank you for... Seth hasn't opened your gift yet, interrupted. Why don't we let him rip them? Rip? Then we'll have some cake. Cake! I'll be whacked her palms around you. Blow the candles out and make a wish. Soon, Grace told her, Seth, take Sibyl to the living room so you can open your gift. Sure. He waited for Sibyl to stay, and then, with a jerk of his shoulder, started out. I got it in Baltimore, she began miserably awkward. So, if I, if it doesn't suit, if you don't like it, Philip can exchange things for you. Okay. He pulled out a box out of the first bag, sat in the style on the floor, and within seconds was tearing up paper and had taken her... Untold agonies to choose the shreds. You could have used newspaper. Philip told her, and chuckling, nudged her into a chair. It's a box, I said, puzzled at Sibyl's heart. So I got his disinterest tone. Yes, well, I kept the receipt, so he can take it back and give whatever he liked. Yeah, okay, but he got the heart, bury him in Philip's eyes and made it never. It's a nice box, but he wanted to roll his eyes. Then he idly flicked the brass hook, flipped the top. Holy shit! Christ! Christ, Seth. Cam muttered it, glancing over her shoulder as Hannah walked in from the kitchen. Man, look at all this stuff. It's got, like, everything. Charcoals and pastels and pencils. Now he looked at Sibyl with that staggered shock. I can't have it all? <laughs> it goes together. Nervous, she twisted her silver beads around her finger. He draws so well, I thought. You may want to experiment with other mediums. The other box has more supplies. More? While I called her, while I call her, and brushes some paper, ah, she's onto the floor, her Seth gleefully ripped into the second box. You may decide you like acrylics or pen and ink, but 
I lean toward watercolors myself, so I thought you might like to try your hand at it. I don't know how to do it. Oh, well, it's a simple process, really. She leaned over to take one of the brushes and began to explain the basic technique as she spoke. She forgot her nerves and smiled at him. The light from the lamp slanted over her face, caught something, something in her eyes that jingled at the corners of his memory. Did you have a picture on the wall? Flowers, white flowers in a blue vase. Their fingers tightened on the breast. Yes, in my bedroom in New York, one of my watercolors. Not a very good one. And he had colored bottles on the table, lots of them, different sizes and stuff. Her few bottles, her throat was closed again, so she was forced to clear. I used to collect them. You let me sleep in your bed with you. His eyes narrowed as he concentrated on the vague blimps of memory, soft smell, soft voice, colors and shape. You told me some story about a frog. The frog pranced into her mind, flashed the images of how a little boy had curled against her, the bedside lamp holding back the dark. For both of them, it was bright blue eyes and tits on her face as she calmed his fears with a tale of magic and happily a raptor. You, you had, when you came to visit, you had bad dreams. You were just a little boy. I had a puppy. You bought me a puppy. Not a real one, just a soft toy. Her vision was blurred. Her vision was blurry. Her throat closed. Her heart pain. You... You didn't have any toys with you. When I brought it home, you asked me whose it was, and I told you it was yours. That's what you called it, yours. You didn't take it when she... I have to go! She shut the I'm sorry, I have to go. And bolted out the door. End of chapter 16.